All right, good evening, everyone. How are you all? Good, good, good. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this day and for the gift of life. We ask now that you would bless our time together in your word. Help us to be better students and stewards of the sacred text that we hold. Help us to learn more about you. In Christ's name, amen. All right, well, where we left off uh, was 1 Corinthians. Last week, I, uh, Reverend Overton was so kind to teach a Bible study. Um, last week, she, she had about two hours. She had very little notice uh, to do so, but I'm grateful that she uh, was able, hey, Danny, was able to uh, step in, and she did a wonderful job. And so now we're back on our New Testament study. Uh, today it is Second Corinthians, right? And so uh, they had a lot of stuff in, in, in Corinth, and so it necessitated two letters, at least two letters that we have. And so remember that the composition of the Christian scriptures is uh, really based on the Torah, and the Torah is your Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, and then the New Testament is a collection of early church letters, basically. Uh, some of those letters we call Gospels, some of them we call uh, histories like Acts. Uh, but Acts was, was first a letter to Theophilus, then that letter was circulated around to tell the early history. Um, First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, Romans, all of these were letters that were circulated to the early churches. And then in around the third century uh, AD, there was a council that came together that decided which books would be authoritative. And so they made the decision really by asking, you know, which of these letters have circulated uh, the widest and which of them have been found to have the greatest value. And so that's how these letters uh, were composed into the New Testament. And so uh, we don't really know how many correspondences that Paul wrote to the Church of Corinth. And we don't have the correspondences that were written to him. What we do have uh, in the New Testament is the letters that were compiled by the early church, those that survived and that were seen as authoritative. So 2 Corinthians is an additional letter that Paul writes. So number one, uh, Corinthians is a letter written by the apostle Peter. See, I was just here if y'all was paying attention, right? right. I'll just, the apostle Paul, okay? To the Christian community in where? Corinth. And remember, you can always tell the title by uh, the first couple of sentences of a book. You can always tell the author by the first couple of sentences of the book. So look what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. So what does that tell you? Come on, come on, come on, come on. We've, we've learned it before. So that Paul had some collaboration in this writing, right? Now, why do I want you to know that? Because people, they get into all type of squabbles about who wrote what in the Bible. And they be like, they didn't even, they didn't even write it. And sometimes, you know, they may be, they, that may be true. It's in the Bible. So who wrote, first, who wrote Second Corinthians? Yes, Paul wrote it. He wrote it. Uh, it says here, and Timothy, our brother. They collaborated on the writing of the document. Now, is that, is that, is that a problem with that? No. No, not at all. It's right there. Uh, we know that Moses, he wrote the first five books of the Bible, but we understand that he had some help, right? Yeah. How do we know that? Because can't nobody write about your death. Don't nobody write about their own death. I died in July 2079. That, it don't quite happen like that. Somebody else has to write this. So we understand there was, there, were, uh, co there was collaboration, there was editing that happened for these books. All right? Uh, look what he says, verse 3. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, 
who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patience, patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And I hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril. And he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. So Paul here, and you'll see this, 1 Corinthians is very practical. It is really dedicated to uh, solving some issues in the Corinthian church. Second Corinthians is different in that Second Corinthians has a higher theological tone. So you read some of the same doctrinal positions that you read, say, in Romans. So Paul here in, first, in the first chapter of Second Corinthians, he adds spiritual significance to his struggles. And this is important for him to do in front of the church at Corinth because he wants them to understand that struggles are not without spiritual value. That whenever we engage or confront any obstacle, whenever we endure any suffering, whenever we are demanded to struggle, don't consider it something that just happened. It is always for your development. It is always for the deepening of your faith. It is always for the promotion of the gospel or putting you on a platform where you can give God glory. So notice he says right there, did you catch that? In um, verse 8, he says, uh, we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despair even of life. Y'all know what that means, right? We were ready to give up. Now, why is that important? This is the Apostle Paul talking. He says, as hard, things got so tough that he was ready to call it quits. But he survived by the grace of God. And so he lifts up this testimony to the church at Corinth to remind them, if I could endure and survive by the help of God, you can too. That's, that's the substance of the letter uh, to, the, to the second letter to the church of Corinth. So number two, in this letter, Paul addresses various issues in the church. He talks about his authority as an apostle. We'll get to that. He talks about the importance of reconciliation and forgiveness. We'll get to that. He talks about the need to support one another in times of trouble. He talks about the importance of living a life of faith and obedience to God. Okay? And we'll, we'll get through all of this. So this, I want you to understand the overview of what he's doing in uh, this letter. Number three, Paul encourages the Christians to be generous in their giving and to remain steadfast in their faith despite facing challenges and opposition. What did you say? Did they? Yeah, they, pr they probably be out in the four years. They made more copies. First, like on number two, His authority. Yeah. So Paul was the only apostle who had not, like, really seen the pre-ascended Jesus Christ. So there were some squabbles about whether or not he was the real deal apostle. So we'll get, we'll get to that in a minute. All right. So that's why his authority as apostle came up. Because folk were like, you didn't even, you didn't even walk with Jesus. How you call yourself an apostle, right? You, you didn't, you didn't, you wasn't on no boats with us. Um, 
So they, they had that. So three, Paul encourages the Corinthians to be generous in their giving. We'll get to that. And to remain steadfast in their faith despite uh, facing challenges and oppositions. And then four, overall, 2 Corinthians serves as a reminder of the power of God's grace. So throughout 2 Corinthians, you can even, from the first chapter, you see, what does he say in verse 11? And you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor. What's that gracious favor? Granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Who's granting that gracious favor? That's God. So in chapter 1, he begins talking about grace. It, it, it's, it has reverberations or overtones of uh, Don, Don Shelley. Uh, that, 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 not Don Shelley. Don, um, Don, Don, what? Staley. Don, I like to call Don Shelley. Don Staley. Uh, when after they won last week, she says, this is uncommon favor, right? So that's basically what Paul is getting at here when he talks about uh, grace all through 2 Corinthians. Um, and the importance of living a life that reflects the teachings of Jesus Christ. So those four things help you to know what 2 Corinthians is all about. It's all wrapped up right there, the who, what, when, and where. Why? Because every book has what? Context, problems too, but context, <laughs> right. And so we've got to, we always want to establish the who, the what, the when, the where, the why as much as we can so that we make sure that we are um, extracting the right application for our lives. We just don't want to take, we, I, I was talking to a member the other day about um, some, one, th one thing that we were studying the other day, uh, a couple of weeks back rather, in Bible study, and I told her you don't, you never want to make a salad of belief. Salad is when you take a tomato here, take a cucumber here, take some bacon bits here, and you make a salad. No rhyme, no reason. That's not what you want to do. You want to have a coherent faith. So believe what you want to believe, but make sure that you understand why you believe it. And make sure that you are using the correct interpretational lenses and stuff out of everywhere. And holding on to stuff that don't really make sense when you put it together. I want you to have a working system of belief. Uh, so there are, there are four divisions in 2 Corinthians. Greetings and thanksgiving. You always have greetings. We just read that. Uh, then Paul's defense of his ministry, the collection for the saints, and Paul's final warning and closing remarks. All right, let's get into this. Um, we've already did number one. Uh, that's comfort in suffering. That's comfort in suffering. So let's go to chapter 2. This is where Paul begins uh, to give some context for his ministry. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did so that when I came I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy for I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so, so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive covenant, by, by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I forgive it in the sight of Christ for your sake in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his scheme. So Paul here is referring to those instances where we have disagreements uh, with other believers. And the fact is, if you are in relationship with anybody, you will have a disagreement. And Paul says you must learn to forgive quickly, because when we don't learn to forgive, 
That's where we give the, the enemy a foothold to outwit us. He says, so we are not uh, confused about the enemy's schemes. Now, why is this critical? Um, I don't know who I heard it from earlier, but it was very helpful. It said, the quote was this, don't hate your enemies for hate clouds your judgment. Oh, that was a quote from the Godfather. Um, but it's a good quote, right? It's a, it's a good quote. And, and when we harbor unforgiveness, the longer you hold on to unforgiveness, the wider the chasm in the heart becomes and the deeper seeds of hatred and envy and anger are planted. And Paul says, in order to avoid that, go on and forgive. Forgive your brother, forgive your sister, but then forgive in sight of other people. Now, that's real hard, ain't it? He says, I'm not just going to forgive personally. I want to forgive publicly. Why? Because it's one thing to forgive uh, an individual person to person. It's another thing for folk to know y'all fell out and for you to forgive. And then it's another thing to forgive in the sight of Christ. So Paul said, read it again, uh, ver, 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 verse 10. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not uh, unaware of his scheme. So he says, you ought to forgive on at least three levels. In front of Christ, in front of, well, forgive personally. Forgive, well, let me say, forgive before Christ. Forgive personally. And forgive publicly. It doesn't mean you got to get up on a stage and say, I forgive you. But it does mean you ought to be able to speak at the family reunion. You ought to be able to ask, how you doing? And mean it. You know that you are forgiven when you don't want any ill will to come to the person you had it out with. And when you get to that place, that's how you know that grace is growing in your heart. And that you are putting some caulk around the passageways of your heart. You know what that is? We got to make sure, you know how you put caulk around the windowsill? Because if you don't, some bugs will crawl in and all kind of, you got, you got, so you got to caulk it real good to keep stuff from getting in. You got to do the same thing spiritually with your heart. Because if you're not careful, some unwanted stuff will seep in and you will fall into the enemy's trap. That's what Paul says. And then he says this, then I went to Trios, Tro, 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 Troas, I'm sorry, to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me. I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. You see that? Read that again. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are the smell of death. To the other, the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with the ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So here Paul is talking about the outgrowth of his ministry. He's saying that if you want proof of the work that I have done, the ministry that I have led, I don't need a letter of recommendation. I have people, people that I can point to that have been the beneficiaries of my ministry. Okay, let's go to chapter four. I'm trying to get through all of it tonight. Answer to number two. Which number two? 
the about freedom in Christ, but we haven't got we had freedom in Christ. Yes. So go to go. I'm sorry. Go to chapter three, verse seventeen. Now this is this is the key passage. This is, this is the crowning passage, crowning verse in this chapter. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. King James says there is liberty, and we who are who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. All right, chapter 4. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary... By setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God? For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord and ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed. It's hard for me to read this in the NIV because I'm used to reading the King James Version. Um, and yeah, But we are, uh, I'll keep reading. We are, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to the death, to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in us in you. Verse 16, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. The King James says an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What powerful words. Paul says you've got to check your focus. That if you're not careful, we'll focus on temporary, transient, fading, non-essential items and situations. Have you ever found yourself having wasted a whole day on something that a week later didn't matter? <laughs> Have you ever invested time or resources in that which decayed? You, you, you worked hard to buy that Louis, and after it got a few scrapes on it and a few Marks and you got through, you know, hearing everybody tell you, ooh, girl, that Louis show looks good on you. And the purse filled up with lint and old peppermints. <laughs> you put it in the closet, right? And forgot you even had it because it's temporary. Paul says, be careful not to focus on what is temporary, but make investments to what is eternal. That's what his whole argument is built on. And he's making the case that to invest in people, that's why he begins by talking about hanging in there when you're suffering. He talks about having grace in trials. He talks about forgiveness, forgiving personally, forgiving in, in, before Christ and forgiving in public because he's investing in people. And he says, we're going to keep on investing because when you invest in people, that is an eternal investment. When you invest in the things of God, that is an eternal investment. When you invest in the kingdom of God, that's eternal. So he says you got to fix your focus on that which is eternal. And that's a struggle for all of us. 
Because if we're not careful, we will spend our lives investing in things that will fade away. Buy one house, buy a bigger house, buy an even bigger house, only to die and leave it to your kids who are going to sell it <laughs> and take the money out of it. Buying, you know, all the Manhattan labels. And it's good to look good. But make sure that you don't invest in your physical house and never think about investing in your spiritual house. Don't, don't spend so much time in what you wear that you don't spend time on who's on the inside of you and are you bearing the fruit of the spirit. It's a good thing to wear nice, it's a nice thing to wear nice clothes, but it's a better thing to bear the fruit of the spirit. Don't spend so much energy on what you drive, make sure that you focus on what drives you. Paul says, I'm not looking at things that are what's seen is temporary. What's unseen is eternal. Now look at how the argument builds. Chapter 5. Now we know that if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a deposit Deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. You see how it makes that argument? So it says, look, I'm not looking at what's temporary. I'm looking at what's eternal. Why? Because we know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And I got to have something to move in that house. Y'all get what I'm saying? So if I, if I spend all of my energies on stuff that's going to pass away, I have added nothing to the decoration of my eternal house that's not made with hands. That's, that's what Paul is, is saying. Six, therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Ain't that something? Mm-hmm. Since then, we know that what is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men what we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it's for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all and that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view though we once regarded Christ in this way we do not any longer for therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him 
we might become the righteousness of God. That's powerful language, right? Yeah, so Paul there, he is, uh, he's saying, number three, that we are new creatures in Christ. Anybody be in Christ? You are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. In order to see it, you've got to see it through a spiritual perspective. Chapter 6. As God's fellow co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time, my favor, I heard you in the days of salvation. I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Verse 4. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, and imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, Known yet regarded as unknown, dying yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We've spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As fair exchange, I speak as my children. Open wide your hearts also. Now, Verse 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, we talked about why Paul makes these kind of statements to the Corinthian church, because they had so many temples in Corinth, all right? And that there was some syncretism among the members of the church of Corinth. All right, let's go to chapter 8. In chapter 8, Paul is making the case about the Corinthian church giving to the Christians in Macedonia. They were in need. So he says uh, this in verse 8. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality as it is written. He who gathered much did not have too much and he who gathered too little did not have too little. Now go to chapter 9. Verse 1. There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the saints. For I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. 
But I'm sending the brothers in order that your boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would. Paul is taking the collection here. <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm, I'm sending somebody to pick up the money. Verse 4. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one begrudgingly given. Remember this, whosoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he who has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The service you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved, proved yourself, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. And in their prayers and in their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So here it's talking about generosity on the part of Christians. Paul is commending them to be generous in their giving. Generosity can be described um, as um, a consistent percentage of one's um, earnings. And Paul says, I don't want to put you on a compulsion, so he doesn't even set the percentage. He just says, give whatever you give, uh, give it generously, give it cheerfully. Now, this is New Testament giving. Um, so we see giving evolve throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, there was tithing, um, there was giving a percentage to the Levites. Um, we see some of that carry over in the New Testament. Then there's the early church. They brought everything they owned, laid it at the feet of the apostles. Uh, it was give as you so prospered. So you'll see in Acts where they literally would sell a field and bring the money to church. Well, by the time we get to Corinthians, we see that evolving because people uh, were not selling their property and bringing the proceeds to the Apostle Paul. So he says to them, I want you to give uh, as God has so prospered you, give generously, give regularly, give cheerfully. Make sense? Okay. Any no questions there? I'm surprised. Generally that's a that's a that's a point of uh, come again. That is Malachi's standard. That's the tithe uh, in Malachi. Now, Paul doesn't necessarily commend that principle. He says give generously uh, because Malachi was under the law. We who are Christians are under grace. So if they were given 10% under the law, the reasoning is you should at least give that. But Paul and other New Testament writers don't put a percentage on it because it's a grace gift. So there are three characteristics of giving in the New Testament. Generously, consistently, cheerfully. So now what's generous That's why we need Malachi <laughs> to give people a starting point, right? But 
people who give far above. There are people who, you know, are blessed in, 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 um, in some particular ways, and they decide that they want to be a blessing to the kingdom. Um, there are other people who give what they can give, and what they could give, and, um, but they do it regularly. There are some seniors in this church who don't necessarily, they give what they can give but we can count on the envelope every month. Um, and that keeps the church moving. It allows the church to do the missions uh, that we do. And I appreciate those, especially during the pandemic. You know, it was interesting. Our seniors, they, you know, they would mail their gifts in. And so I don't know what their personal income was. All of the gifts were not huge amounts, but they were consistent. They were, knowing some of them, I believe they were generous. And they clearly was cheerful because, you know, it's one thing to give in church where they pass the basket and you say, oh, it's offering time. <laughs> Let me, you know, like Zoe does me, Daddy, you got a dollar? <laughs> um, it's another thing to prioritize your giving and put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, put it in the mail, or go, go to Zale and do it, or however you do it. So that's what Paul is talking about, prioritizing uh, giving. And that's, that's the argument that he's pushing. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, if good question. He's saying, is it net or gross, right? <laughs> and um, based on Malachi, it's gross. Your your tithe is based on gross. Uh, now there are people who can't do that. There are people who have all types of extenuating circumstances. Mortgage, raising kids, um, paying for college, you know, they own uh, co uh, 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 um, college loans. All of that factors in. Gotten in debt trying to get out of it. Um, and people have to make decisions, and I don't mind saying this openly because I shouldn't say it, but I will say it. I, I don't, for, every now and then I look at the tithing records, um, the giving records. I don't know the most people tithing. So people are already making some considerations about their finances. And that's not saying we don't, we don't got some people who tithe. I, I will say the math don't be mathing <laughs> for some individuals. Some members. Now, what the principle that we ought to strive to live up to is consistent. So whatever you give, give it consistently. So maybe you're not at 10% yet. Can you do 5%? And can you do 5% consistently? And after you done did 5% for two years, three years, and you, done, you got a little bit more you know, flexibility, can you do 7%? Um, you know, I think we ought to grow beyond working a full-time job and giving $10 every Sunday. <laughs> now, we appreciate the $10. The $10 helps us feed the hungry and you know, do some other things around, but we ought to grow to different levels of giving. So that's, what, that's, so that's why there's a distinction um, between what Paul is writing in 2 Corinthians and what Malachi writes. Uh, me personally, I try to live up to the 10%. It just helps me with my calculations. And it helps me be consistent. Are there times where I have fallen short? Absolutely. Uh, are there times where God has blessed me to be able to exceed that? Yes. Um, but I think the, the principle 
The second Corinthians principle is generously, cheerfully, consistently. Uh, yes. Any other questions about that? Hope I didn't muddy that too much for you. I guess what I'm trying to do is free some of my members who um, they say, oh, you know, we ain't got to lie about tithing, all right? Folk can count. Um, so it's, it's okay. What we, what we need to do is grow in grace. Grow, grow in our understanding. And the first, the first principle is just be honest with yourself, right? And so just prioritizing that giving and doing what we can do and, um, and, and growing. I saw a hand. Where do your time and talent? We cannot spend your time and talent. Um, we, you know, <laughs> I'm halfway. Yeah, so, yeah, so she asked a good question. Where does your time and talent come in? Yeah, that, so, <laughs> um, yeah, yes, you're right. Um, she said, sometimes you don't have it. We all ought to be giving our treasure into the kingdom. We all ought to be giving our talents into the kingdom. We all should give our time to the kingdom. It's not really an either or, it's a all three. Um, now if, you, if you just don't got it to give, you just don't got it to give, let's pray about it and add, you don't have it to give right now to that sentence. There are cases where we may be able to, there are in-kind gifts. Like we had, our, had a room painted and a brother said, hey, I can't tithe right now, but I can paint that room. Well, that was a, we could kind of put a monetary, uh, we could put a price tag on that because we know how much he would have charged otherwise and appropriate that. Mm -hmm. So you strive for all three. If I, I, hope, I hope I'm making sense to you. Um, in the household of faith, we need talent. We need treasure. We need time. And however you break that down, uh, that's between you and the Lord. But remember, the Bible says the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. And that's giving of your time, your talent, and your treasure. So if you come in here grumpy, talking about I'm giving my time, go back home. Because <laughs> God loveth a cheerful, how, how are you doing? What Paul is wanting them to do is be conscious of it. Be conscious of it. Yes, ma'am. It, it can, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yes, but it's not an either or. It's not an either or. It's, it's, we, we strive to do them all. So I want to give God my treasure. I also want to give God my time. I also want to give God my talent. Um, often we kind of get all that messed up. You know, we'll say, I gave my money, but I ain't, don't want to be around there. Or we won't give no money and we'll say we give time. Um, We struggle in the talent area. People who have the, often the best, people who are very talented in certain areas, very gifted in certain areas, don't often do those things in church because they want to break from them. They often do that in the world. So we have people with bad backs on the usher board. Um, and ushering 
is a talent. And it's hard to do it with a bad back because a bad back affects your attitude. And so now you, you fussing at members and visitors coming in because you were in pain. We need you to sit down and let's tap into another talent, right? Or we have people attempting to um, serve in administrative spaces who are just not gifted at that. There are some people who can just work, run circles administratively around people. Uh, that's, a, that's a talent, that's a gift. And that's something that we really need. And we can't pay for all that we need. When some of the uh, big events and things that we do, or some of just the keeping these ministries on, on target takes some real gifts. So I think there's a place for, for all of it. Yeah, yeah. All right, chapter three. Uh, no, I didn't say chapter three. I'm going to bed, and we almost at eight o'clock. So I, <laughs> y'all can read chapter three at your own home. <laughs> we almost at eight o'clock. I done did my time. <laughs> I'm about to be off the clock. All right. Uh, now, chapter twelve. Remember, I told you uh, it, it's about the whole. The whole chapter is about grace. The whole book is about grace. God's grace in our struggles. Paul says, "I must go on boasting." Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows. Was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I'll boast about a man like that. But I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I will not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to tort. Let me say one more thing about giving that just hit me. I'm sorry, I got to say this. Because I read it on Facebook, and I thought it was the dumbest thing. Somebody, and I just hope nobody's done. Somebody said, why are you giving to the church, and you can't pay your rent? I agree. Now, if you're doing that, you really need some financial literacy. And we can help you with that at the church. But you ought not be, I know we, we can over-spiritualize some things sometimes. And that's good. But buy your medicine. Does that make sense? Pay your rent. Please pay your rent. The trustees have only allowed us a certain amount of money to help people with their rent. It is April, and we're probably about done. We about done, Sister Jackson? Sister Jackson said we done. <laughs> pay your rent. Like I told Harrison, I was trying to give some financial literacy lessons, because he's 14, and he will be flying soon. And I told him, if you ain't got enough money to pay all your bills, pay your rent and your mortgage first. Because you can survive without lights. Uh-huh. You might have to survive every now and then without water. Go down to the Chick-fil-A and sponge off. But if they put you out, Right? Amen? All right. So I just want to say, as we talk about giving, make sure that you employ common sense. Don't be in here falling out because you didn't go buy your diabetes medicine. I'm talking about I tithed it. So I'm, that, we're going to leave you in the flow until Jesus comes. <laughs> Should take your medicine. Buy your medicine. And then find ways to be more responsible stewards of what God has given us. I just want to say that, not for y'all, but for people online who might be listening, because often we have those kind of conversations in the air. And if you, and if you ever go to anybody's church, any pastor, and they're asking you to give, um, 
the money that is necessary for you to live on, for you to survive and thrive as a human being, you probably want to get out of that church. Because God does not uh, want us to ignorantly, ignorantly put ourselves in bad positions. He does not want us to put ourselves in places where we are doing that which he does not require. So I just want to just want to put that out there. All right. Don't be mad. I'm not trying to be irreverent when I say that. And of course, I'm a pastor. I want you to give. I do. But if it comes between giving and your rent, pay your rent. Let the church say amen. Amen. All right. All right. Back to the story. It was a good one. Seven. To keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassingly great revelations that was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast in all my, more, all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may, be, may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness in insults, and in hardships, and persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Okay? And so that really uh, encapsulates uh, the entirety of 2 Corinthians. You see 2 Corinthians has a, has a much different tone than 1 Corinthians. That 1 Corinthians is a book. But, you know, in 2 Corinthians, we see the themes shift a little bit. All right. Um, any, any questions? Come again? Oh, five, strength and weakness. And four is God loves a cheerful giver. All right, so really from here on, here moving forward, we have uh, much, much, much more manageable books. Um, and so... Uh, I hope that you all can get back. Next week we have Galatians. It's a good book. Um, and so try to read that before next Wednesday. That is six chapters in Galatians. And so if you start tomorrow, by the time you get to next Wednesday, you'll have it all read and digested. All right? All right, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for time in your word. As we leave this place, give us traveling grace and arriving mercy. We ask your blessings tonight on Sister Tempe Grant, on, Sister, on Brother Michael Pinkert, uh, for Brother King, for Reverend Hagen, Mrs. Hagen, Sister Gertrude Wimbry, and all of those who are in need of your healing touch. We ask that your presence will be felt with them even now. And go with us as we travel to our destinations. Help us to find all things well when we reach them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Did you ever get your green I did not.